Hello and welcome on this Good Friday to this time of praise, prayer and proclamation of God's word. I greet all who are listening, especially those from Ahori and Clare Presbyterian churches, in the name of our King and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. On this Good Friday, let us look to Jesus. Let us survey his wondrous cross. Let us sing together. Let us pray. Our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, there is none like you. You alone are glorious in holiness. You alone are infinitely, eternally and unchangeably beautiful. And yet we confess that our hearts so often beat for lesser things. So many 
Vain things charm us more than the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Our affections and therefore our lives are in disarray. Father, have mercy upon us, we pray. Uh, pardon our iniquity, we pray. Through your Son, who for us shed his precious blood. And by your Spirit, draw us, we pray, to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and to run with endurance this race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of your glorious throne. Father, as we survey his wondrous cross, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. May we count our richest gain as loss and pour contempt on all our pride. And may this love, this love so amazing, so divine, that demands our, our soul, our life, our all, may this love be our, our wonder, our joy. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn now to listen to the word of God, uh, to the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament and to the Gospel of Mark in the New. Uh, several years ago, I began a, a four-part series looking at four words that help us to understand uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ achieved on the cross. Uh, the four words being propitiation, redemption, justification, and reconciliation. Big words for immense truths. Um, for a couple of Good Fridays running, uh, we looked at the first two words, uh, but then the, the pandemic arrived and uh, occasioned a change of course. Uh, now we could resume uh, the series this evening, but for several reasons, uh, not least the, the time lapse, I've decided to restart it. We can never think about these truths too much or too deeply. So this evening, uh, we will look again at the first word, namely propitiation. Uh, our text will be Romans 3 verse 25, but first, let's slow down and let Isaiah and Mark set the tone. So please turn with me uh, in your Bible to Isaiah in the Old Testament and to chapter 52, and we will read from verse 13 of chapter 52 through to verse 12 of chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 52, beginning to read at verse 13. Let us listen to the word of God. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the, sprink of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Now please turn with me to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Mark, and firstly to the 14th chapter. Uh, where we, we will read from verse 32 through to verse 42 of Mark chapter 14. So Mark chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 32. And again, let us listen to the word of God. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they, they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And please look down to the next chapter, chapter 15, and to verse 21. We'll read from verse 21 through to verse 39. Mark chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place called Golgotha, 
which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. And divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Amen. So reads the word of God. Let us pray. Father, as we come now to listen to the preaching of your holy word, by faith we stand, as it were, at the foot of Mount Calvary. Give us strength to climb the hill. Give us grace to lift our eyes. May we linger there. May we see the king of the universe bleeding his heart out for us. And may the Holy Spirit move us to trembling love and fill us with trembling thankfulness. For Jesus' sake. Amen. In the 2008 film Seven Pounds, Will Smith plays the role of Ben Thomas, a man who several years before had experienced a life-shattering car accident. Uh, he sets out to change the lives of seven strangers and he meets and falls in love with a cardiac patient called Emily. He gives his life for her. He literally donates his heart to her. It is a moving story. Emily could say, by his death, I live. Now, this is the language, supremely, of the Christian. The Christian, as he stands at the foot of Mount Calvary, at the Christian, as he surveys the wondrous cross, the Christian, as he sees the Son of God bleeding and dying, the Christian may say, by his death, I live. There is no story so moving, no reality more captivating 
Yet we can lose the wonder of the cross. Our hearts can be moved by other stories. Our hearts can be captivated by lesser realities. The Holy Spirit knows this, and for this very reason, in the Bible, he exhorts us to look to Jesus, to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He calls us, like Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Spurgeon, the 19th century preacher, to abide hard by the cross and search the mystery of Christ's wounds. He calls us, like Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer, to have Calvary so prominently in our minds that we feel as though Jesus died only yesterday. This is our goal this evening. We want to fix our eyes on Mount Calvary. We want to survey the wondrous cross on which our salvation was achieved. Uh, now, we could do so from several vantage points. Uh, we could go to the marketplace and looking to Calvary, marvel at our redemption. We could go to the law court and looking at Calvary, wonder at our justification. Uh, we could go to the home and looking to Calvary, we could glory in our reconciliation. But this evening, I want us to go to the temple, the place of religious ceremony. I want us to see the priests, hear the animals, smell the blood. And from the temple and its courts, I want us to look to Mount Calvary. I want us to look up to that hill and I want us to see the great high priest shedding his own blood for us, dying that we might live achieving propitiation. Now, the word propitiation is unfamiliar to us. We do not use it in everyday conversation. Uh, but it is a vitally important word in the Bible. Uh, and the ESV translation, like the Old King James Version, rightly includes it. It's only used a few times in the New Testament, but its significance outstrips the number of the times it is used. Uh, in Hebrews 2 verse 17, we read, Christ had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. 1 John 2 verse 2 says, Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world and in first john 4 verse 10 we read in this is love not that we have loved god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins but what does it mean what does the word propitiation mean well, to answer this question, we'll take as our focus another verse in which it is found, namely Romans 3, verse 25. The Apostle Paul writes, God put Christ forward as a propitiation by his blood. And from this text, and, and indeed from the whole Bible, I want to set before you this evening this definition of propitiation. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. This is the staggering truth at which we will marvel this evening, and we will do so by touching on two realities namely the reality of God's wrath, and then secondly, the reality of God's love. Firstly then, see the reality of God's wrath. See the reality of God's wrath. In Romans 1 verse 18 through chapter 3 verse 20, Paul shows why salvation is necessary. He proves that apart from faith in Christ, no one is righteous. No one is in a right relationship with God. 
He writes in chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And in chapter 2, verse 5, he moves beyond the present to the future. He writes, because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Friends, here is the scary reality. God is very angry with sinners. It is right for him to be very angry. It would be wrong for him not to be very angry. If he were simply, as it were, to brush sin, to brush evil under the carpet, he would deny himself. He would cease to be God's. The universe would implode. It is right for him to be very angry. It would be wrong for him not to be very angry. And there is nothing we can do about it. This is the sobering truth by which we are confronted in these chapters in Romans. By nature, we are sinners in the hands of a rightly angry God. In Psalm 7 verses 11 through 13, we read, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. God is rightly furious with unrepentant sinners. Do we rebel at this truth? Yes, of course we do. We move to say, this is a little bit strong. We rebel at this truth. But why do we rebel? Listen to the English theologian Michael Reeves on this. He writes, naturally, I think I'm lovely. So if God is holy, uh, if God is set apart from me, I assume the problem is with him. Uh, his holiness looks like a prissy rejection of my happy, healthy loveliness. Dare I burst my own bubble now? I must. For the reality is that I am the cold, selfish, vicious one, full of darkness and dirtiness. God is right to be angry. But you may protest, isn't he a God of love rather than a God of wrath? Well, it is indeed wonderfully true that God abounds in love not in wrath. It is wonderfully true that, that wrath is his strange work, while his darling attribute is, is mercy. But we must be clear that to say that God is angry is not to deny his love. Surprisingly, it's quite the opposite. Again, as Michael Reeves has written, God's anger is holy, set apart from our temper tantrums. It is how he in his love reacts to evil. It is the proof of the sincerity of his love that he truly cares. His love is not mild-mannered and limp. His love is livid, potent, and committed. The words of John Stott also are helpful in this regard. He writes, the wrath of God does not mean that he is likely to fly off the handle at the most trivial provocation, still less that he loses his temper for no apparent reason. 
For there is nothing capricious or arbitrary about the holy God, nor is he ever irascible, malicious, spiteful or vindictive. His anger is neither mysterious nor irrational. It is never unpredictable, but always predictable, because it is provoked by evil and by evil alone. The wrath of God is his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all its forms and manifestations. Friends, this is sobering. By nature, this wrath is set against us. God is very angry. It is right for him to be very angry. It would be wrong for him not to be very angry. And there is nothing that we can do about it. This is our fearful condition. A condition way more fearful, infinitely more fearful than coronavirus or any other health condition. And if we are to be saved from this condition, God's wrath, God's holy, righteous wrath must be quenched, absorbed, propitiated. Astonishingly, overwhelmingly, God himself has taken the initiative to do just this. In Romans 3.25, we read that God put Christ forward as a propitiation by his blood. So friends, see not only the reality of God's wrath, but also, secondly, the reality of God's love. See the reality of God's love. As the diamond shines more brightly on black cloth, so God's love shines and sparkles with holy luster and radiance against the backdrop of his wrath. Paul introduces uh, his love in Romans chapter 3 with those wonderful words in verse 21. But now we were under his wrath, bound for hell. But now God has intervened. And he shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now probe with me the immensity of this mighty love. Do not gloss over this. Remember, God is very angry. It is right for him to be very angry. It would be wrong for him not to be very angry. And there is nothing that we can do about it. God must satisfy his wrath uh, to, satisfy, to satisfy himself, to be himself. He must satisfy his wrath. How then could sinners like us ever be saved? This is the, the great question that we face. How could God ever possibly save us while at the very same time satisfying himself? How could he express his love and yet at the same time satisfy his wrath? How could it be? Well, the answer is overwhelming. The answer is astonishing. The answer is the wonder and the marvel of all the angels in heaven and ever shall be world without end. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against the sinners. He loved, he turned his wrath away from us by turning it upon himself. God propitiated God. God the Father, in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, absorbed his own wrath against the sinners he loved. Wrath has been averted from us because it has been absorbed 
by him. In breathtaking love. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. Listen again to John Stott on this. He helps us further to marvel at this breathtaking truth. He writes, if it is God's wrath which needed to be propitiated, it is God's love which did the propitiating. It is God himself who in holy wrath needs to be propitiated. God himself who in holy love undertook to do the propitiating and God himself who in the person of his son died for the propitiation of our sins. Divine love triumphed over divine wrath by divine self-sacrifice. Overwhelming. God put Christ forward as a propitiation by his blood. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. All we can do all we can do is fall on our knees and say, I can't comprehend this fathomless love. I'm gripped, amazed by what you have done. Why would the adored become the despised to bear all the furious wrath that was mine? How awesome this mystery of your fathomless love to me. In Christ, God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. Here is the fearful and joyful wonder of propitiation. Here is the glory of the cross. Shall we pray? Father, we scarce know what to say. In this is love. Not that we have loved you, but that you loved us and sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins. Father, help us to see the reality of your wrath. A greater and more fearful reality, infinitely more fearful than coronavirus or any other condition. But help us also, Father, then, upon seeing something of the reality of your wrath, to see also the reality of your love. Help us to see how, in the person of your own dear Son, you lovingly absorbed your own wrath against us. So, Father, impress the wonder of propitiation upon our hearts. Lead us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. So impress your word upon us. So impress the wonder of propitiation upon us that we each may say this Good Friday, looking to Calvary, looking to Jesus, by his death, I live. May we come as sinners to this matchless, this only Saviour. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen. Let us marvel further at the wonder of propitiation achieved at Calvary. Let us marvel at the power of the cross. Let us sing.
curse of free I am free Death is crushed to Thank you for joining us this evening. I pray you have been moved by the wonder of propitiation, uh, moved to embrace the crucified Lord Jesus, in whom God lovingly absorbed his own wrath against sinners. And now may the grace of this Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all tonight until the return of the King, in whose wounds the names of his believing people are written, and then forevermore. Amen. <laughs>